For the next few days, the world's top biophysicists will be flocking right here to beautiful, sunny San Diego. The Biophysical Society's annual meeting is finally here, and we're so thrilled to be on the ground showing you all the research, discussion, and excitement it has to offer. Hello, I'm Lamore Abrams, your host of BPS TV. It's the only place to get all the highlights from this year's BPS meeting. Today, we'll be talking to Gail Robertson about her year as president of BPS. Then Ben Schuler will break down his research on intrinsically disordered proteins. Philip Nelson will share information about his undergraduate course in modeling and simulation. And finally, Nikhil Malvinkar will tell us all about protein nanowares. We'll also visit top institutions from around the world to hear all about their incredible research. But first, let's hear from two of our meeting chairs to see what they're most excited about at this year's conference. It's exciting to see this conference come together after two years of hard work. Um, it's not just the work from us, but it's a collaborative effort from uh, the programming committee, the council, and the membership. This would not have been possible without the help that we received from the program committee, the input that we received from the community at large, and I, this program represents the best of biophysics and in many sense we feel privileged to be able to contribute meaningfully to the society. What we really wanted to do in this meeting was uh, give a broad overview of all of the exciting work in many different areas from uh, DNA and the field of RNA uh, to, to protein design and folding. We are really um, hoping that our junior colleagues uh, really uh, are, uh, realize that uh, biophysics is at the leading edge of technology and biology and they see us as a welcoming diverse community and hopefully they will come back next year as excited as we are. Scientists think of cellular membranes as a two-dimensional liquid with membrane proteins as icebergs floating in this liquid. This is referred to as the fluid mosaic model. The symposium, 50 years after the fluid mosaic model, will highlight emerging ideas on how lipid membranes and membrane-associated proteins interact dynamically and how they self-assemble in heterogeneous mixtures. In the symposium on protein fold, we will hear from experts who have been at the forefront of developing alpha fold the revolutionary new protein prediction software. Other experts in this symposium will highlight and will provide a glimpse of the future of protein structure prediction. Over the past 15 years, optogenetics as a field has grown dramatically. In this symposium, we will hear from experts who are taking the field to new directions. These include identification of new types of optogenetic probes, including development of neural probes that are stimulated by sound waves instead of light. The new and notable symposium will feature exciting new discoveries across a wide range of biophysical research, including cryo-EM analysis of activated cold sensing channels, membrane shaping by integral membrane proteins, and electrically conductive protein nanowires. Here now with Professor Gail Robertson, BPS President. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. How did you become involved with BPS, and how did it change your experience as a woman in science? Well, it actually formed my experience as a woman in science because I, I think my first visit to, my first um, time at a BPS meeting was as an undergraduate. And so really, as I was becoming a scientist, and even before you could really call me a scientist, I came to this meeting. And it was a, I think it was a transformative event that first year and the years after. I've been coming almost every year. Wow, very yeah. experienced here. <laughs> yeah. What are some of your proudest accomplishments from your year as president? I would say um, one thing we did that hadn't been done in, in a very long time in the society was to establish a strategic planning um, event uh, where everybody came to my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin this past year and um, we set out to really define what 
matters to us as a society, scientifically and culturally and morally. And now those are the values by which uh, Biophysical Society Council, which is the governing body, um, conducts itself. What's your advice for incoming president, Tahip Ha? T uh, yeah, TJ. Um, you know, TJ Ha does not need any advice from me. He's a very wise man and he's already a good listener. So I think that is uh, something that's very important for the, the president um, to, uh, a quality to have as good listening skills. Um, I guess I would encourage him to be bold because it's surprising what you can accomplish in this position. It's not um, a, a situation where you kind of just float through this ceremonial role. You can effect change. And I think it's important for anybody coming into this position to realize that. It's a very exciting um, opportunity and it's a, it's a great, great honor. One of the unusual uh, opportunities I had in this role was um, the really the responsibility of writing a monthly column for the biophysical bulletin which is the newsletter of the society and I took this opportunity to to really promote what is important to me in terms of diversity and mentoring and the great joy of being a scientist to really encourage the next generation to to carry on that um, that torch and, um, and I think that um, from the responses I got, mostly from junior people, but not entirely, it was also from senior people who are really developing, evolving ideas about what it means to be a mentor and how to truly be an effective mentor. Um, I got a lot of, of very positive feedback from that and I felt this was another opportunity to uh, have a positive influence on the society. What a rewarding one year. Yeah, it has been. I'm, I feel very privileged to have had this opportunity. It's incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Gail Robertson. And now let's head to Stanford's SLE Cryo-EM Center, funded by the National Institutes of Health. The center is a research, training, and dissemination resource for cryogenetic electron microscopy. The Cryo-EM program that has been developed at Stanford and SLAC is, I believe, very user-friendly, and it can address the needs and goals of people who are well aware of the tools and what they can do, as well as people who are completely new to these kinds of ways of addressing uh, experiments in biosciences, particularly. Cryogen is the perfect thing for RNA. In many ways, RNA is the perfect molecule for pushing the limits of cryogen. And so, uh, again, through our work here at S2C2, are, uh, we've set records for the smallest molecules that you can image through cryo-EM, and we're now working on ways to try to resolve the motions of, of molecules in a way that goes well beyond what's been done before. The approach to developing this program was very much because we felt there was a unique opportunity for SLAC and Stanford to work together. By looking at cells in three dimensions, the research team at the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering Section for Cellular and Supermolecular Structure and Function is uncovering new details about the inner workings of cells that were previously impossible to see. Our lab of cellular and supramolecular structure and function is unique at the NIH in having a background in uh, physics, of electron scattering, which allows us to develop more sensitive techniques for studying cellular structure. We have a variety of instruments, all based on electron microscopy and focused electron probes. One of the projects that I've been working on recently and sort of completed recently is uh, the project on erythropoiesis. And the question was, as the cells develop from the stem cell, 
towards the red blood cell. What happens in between in terms of the iron accumulation? And basically it was just a beautiful study of structure, function, relationship, which you need to do in three dimensions because you can't tell what happens in 2D. And we're here with Professor Ben Schuler of the University of Zurich looking at the interaction dynamic of disordered proteins. Thank you so much for joining us this morning Thank on you. the very first day of the conference. We're going to take a quick look at your research um, focusing on molecular mechanisms of disordered protein interactions. How do these interactions differ from a textbook understanding of folded proteins? Yeah, so if you look at the textbook pictures of interacting proteins, typically what you will find is the interaction between two folded proteins that have a well-defined three-dimensional structure and they interact with a well-defined interface right where they sort of really lock into each other mm -hmm. in a very specific configuration and that's how they bind right that's sort right. of the the idea of protein binding that we've grown up with over, sure. the, over the decades. Keeping you quite busy, I understand it's taken uh, quite a long time to identify and actually recognize these disordered complexes. What misconceptions in the field have led to this? Yeah, so uh, historically, I mean, you must realize that we only know since the 1950s mm -hmm. that proteins are well-defined sequences of amino acids. Um, and shortly after, it became clear that you can crystallize some proteins. Right? Right. X-ray crystallography has mm -hmm. been the dominant technique in the second half of the 20th century, and it's been an enormous success story. We have all of this high resolution information of these folded proteins, how they bind to ligands, how they interact. And so it's only, it was only towards the end of the 20th century when, when really evidence for these disordered proteins accumulated. And then um, genome sequencing at the turn of the millennium really enabled the discovery that there's so many disordered proteins in our proteomes, right? In your and my mm -hmm. pro human proteomes, about a third uh, of the of the protein sequences are disordered, and um, so it's really only been over the last 10, 20 years that this has gained acceptance, and I would say over the last 10 years or so that that these disorder complexes have really uh, moved to center stage, and we're, I think so far we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg um, of these types of complexes, and there is a lot to discover, and we're discovering a lot of new interaction mechanisms and the like. Um, yeah, and so on Wednesday there, there will be a, a symposium on this topic here on yeah. Wednesday afternoon um, at the Biophysical Society meeting um, where four speakers will, uh, will illustrate their recent results on the topic. So, so many different minds coming together to try to understand this still seems like an evolving topic. Oh, it is, certainly. Also because there are so many techniques involved right? and we are really both on the conceptual side we're understanding, but also on the technical side, we're developing more tools to understand this behavior because this is another reason why it took long, I think, to, to identify these proteins is because the technical tools just were not available. Incredible. And so this has really uh, changed our view of proteins over the decades. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Ben Schuler. And now we're going to take you inside the exhibit hall where Northern Nanopore Instruments are working to unlock the full potential of solid state nanopores. So solid state nanopores are uh, tiny holes in thin membranes similar in size to a molecule of uh, protein or DNA. And the idea is that we run ionic current through the pore and whenever one of these biomolecules passes through the pore, it blocks some of that current. And from the shape of that blockage, we can infer something about the molecule, size, charge, shape, uh, sequence, or molecular identity. These nanopores have been uh, promising disruptions to things like DNA sequencing, proteomics, even the next generation of digital information storage, drug discovery, uh, for a long time now. But until recently, they were stuck in research labs because the methods used to fabricate them didn't scale. Um, they were uh, expensive, slow, and manual. Recently, at the University of Ottawa, the Northern Nanopore team invented a method to fabricate these things, which we've called controlled breakdown, that is essentially a, a static shock at the nanoscale that we can use to controllably and very precisely fabricate these, these solid state pores for molecular sensing. Um, and we've uh, packaged that into an instrumentation package that we're now selling to researchers all over the world. So we have a suite of software offering. The first one is the fabrication software that allows us to fabricate a nanopore to a specific size 
and uh, doing quality control at the same time. And it's all automated. And then we have the data analysis software that allows us to characterize and fit complex nanopore signals and also to stratify events based on those fits and a suite of visualization features where we can visualize up to 40 pieces of descriptive uh, metadata that will characterize your events. So we think we have one of the most comprehensive data analysis suite out there for researchers that are interested in nanopores. So our clients are a diverse mix of academic and industrial researchers. What sets us apart as an instrumentation company is that all of our tools are completely application agnostic. We provide researchers the means to make precisely the pores they need for their specific application without restricting what they do with them. And because we've worked with all of these systems ourselves as a team, we've been working with solid state nanopores for almost 10 years at this point. We're able to engage with our customers and assist with any uh, elements and any downstream applications of these, uh, of these sensors. So long term, we are uh, building systems to enable personalized medicine using uh, single molecule proteomics based on solid state nanopores. En route, we're building up the solid state nanopore research community and providing tools that let a much broader subset of researchers get involved and to bring in a new generation of solid state nanopore researchers to accelerate the, the pace of research in the field. Thank you so much, Philip Nelson, for joining us virtually. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Lamar. It's great to be here. I'd like to know what disciplines your students are coming from, those who take your class. Yeah, Lamar, I teach a class to a room full of uh, undergraduate students who are in their second year and higher, and they come from a lot of different majors. They come from biochemistry, uh, bioengineering, other engineering departments, biophysics, because we have such a major. They come from a lot of different majors, but they all want to learn something about modeling. And uh, they're all not afraid of being a little bit quantitative because we have a lot of students who are not afraid of that. And why is it so important for students to learn about modeling and simulation early in their careers? I think it's very important for people to study a little bit of modeling and simulation as early as possible in their careers. First of all, there's data visualization. Everybody's going to need that no matter what they do in the technical world. And it's not something that you get when you take computer science 101. We can't just tell them, take computer science 101. Also, I think. Every paper I read has some modeling and simulation. Even if it's in the supplementary information, that paper could not get published without it, and my students realize that, and they know that they need those sorts of skills. Uh, I think modeling and simulation is very good for developing uh, intuition and for developing an insight into what questions should be asked and what experiment needs to be done. Now, are students with little computer experience still able to excel in your class? Every time I teach my class on the first day, I ask them to self-report on their computing skills and uh, how much coding they've done, and about half the class says zero. Yes, they are able to excel. We bring them up to speed. We have found that uh, Python is a language that they can get up to speed pretty quickly, and uh, we can just add a little bit every week. And to them, it's so much more exciting than just taking a computer science course where everything is done in the abstract. It's good to know how to make a graph. It's better to know how to make an animated graph because animated graphs have a plot line. They tell a story. And uh, as you can see in the animation that I'm showing right here, I personally never really understood adaptation and bacterial chemotaxis until I made this little simulation and turned it into an animation and watched the storyline. Then I can see the level of activation of the receptors. It's shown here in color. It's converging on some universal value. Whenever the level of chemoattractant is being held constant, that you get that rainbow color that you see in the graph. Uh, only when the level of chemoattractant jumps do you get a big change in the activation. How is that possible? Well, you can also see that in the graph as the bars move back and forth, that's the level of methylation. So by presenting more than one thing at a time, in a time series, uh, that enters your brain in a very different way than reading a lot of words on the page, and students find that very powerful. And thank you so much for joining us, Philip Nelson. Now to Germany, to the Center of Structural Biology. CCSB brings together three universities and six research institutes with one goal in mind, understanding the molecular mechanisms of infections. The Center for Structural Systems Biology is a collaborative uh, research center and brings together world-class research institutes in the north of Germany. Particular expertise is in structural biology, infection biology, but also systems biology, so bringing in computational tools that integrate uh, the various ends. 
We investigate the molecular mechanism of infections with the aim to understand the structure, dynamics and function of pathogens and their interactions with the host. This fundamental research can also enable the identification of potential targets for interventions. So one of the molecular complexes that we worked on is a nuclear POC complex. And here we used artificial intelligence-based modeling to map the structure of the human nuclear POC complex at unprecedented completeness and uh, precision. I expect the next big milestones to be in modeling dynamics of macromolecular assemblies and identify new targets for drug discovery. The Ernst Ruska Center houses some of the world's most advanced electron microscopes and tools for nano characterization. The aim of their research is to advance electron microscopy methods. The Ernst Ruska Center is a national user facility. All of our colleagues from all over the world can have access to these very special instruments. This has been a world renowned center for material science electron microscopy. We have been extending this, investigating and imaging biological macromolecules. The Ansuska Center offers the whole range of facilities to determine protein structures or investigate cells. We have one of Europe's fastest supercomputers here. We have been very interested in scanning transmission electron microscopy methods. We can really compute high resolution structures. Using this method, we were able to reveal the helical structure of tobacco mosaic virus. It's really a, one of the first examples where we apply a high-end uh, material science method to the life sciences and already have such an immediate success. now with Professor Nikhil Malvankar of Yale studying protein nanowares, huge topic. Let's look at what important discoveries your lab has made regarding protein nanowares and Geobacter. Did I get that right? Yes, so <laughs> Geo is Earth and our lab studies this bacteria called Geobacter, which is one of the most common bacteria in all of our soil. And uh, the, this bacteria can grow without any oxygen like soluble molecules by projecting tiny protein filaments called nanowires. And in 2009, our lab discovered that these nanowires have uh, made up of metal containing molecules called cytochromes. And in 2020, we were able to discover some other nanowires. And this has completely changed our understanding of how this bacteria can respire without anything like oxygen. That's incredible. It, that's pretty unusual too, I imagine. Yeah, it's, it's really the mother nature has perfected billions of years of evolution so that they can use these nanowires as a snorkel to send electricity over 100 times the size of a bacteria. How did these discoveries lead to creating the first synthetic assembly of nanowires outside bacteria? So these nanowires are very difficult to study with Geobacter because it's, it's a challenging bacteria to grow in the lab. So um, recently, um, our lab with uh, Yuri Launder was able to genetically engineer bacteria to express the protein which makes these nanowires by the work laid by my student Yang Shigu. And now we can make these nanowires both at large quantity and high purity without using Geobacter. So we can figure out how bacteria can make these nanowires on demand. And these nanowires have a sugar binding domain which bacteria can remove and that assembles them into nanowires. What applications could we see from this? So uh, my dream is if we can charge up our cell phone with these bacteria which are you know, ground beneath our feet. But in the short term, the, these bacteria are important uh, for many environmental processes such as cleaning up radioactive waste, generating electricity, and understanding how they use these nanowires will allow us to uh, speed up these processes. And just like Geobacter, many bacteria which either uh, consume methane or produce methane also show genes similar to these nanowires. So we are now looking into how can we use that uh, knowledge 
to control how much methane is released to the atmosphere to combat climate change. How fast can these developments happen? So now we have the molecular structures available. So we are now working in the laboratory to uh, understand how electrons move in the system. And once uh, you know, we have the mechanism uh, understood, then we'll be able to harness that knowledge. So much more to see about protein nanowires. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, our very first episode of VPS TV for this year is over and done, but the excitement's definitely not over yet. You can keep watching VPS TV around the convention center, on the VPS website, in your hotel room, and on YouTube and Twitter. Tomorrow, more excitement. We will be back with more features from top exhibitors, plus a look into what VPS student chapters have brewing for Biophysics Week and an interview with President-elect Tahit Pa. Until next time, I'm Lamore Abrams.